All right, let's talk about friction. There are two basic models of friction, and I, I refer to it as the nook and cranny model and the attraction model. Now, if I have a table right here and I have a book sitting on top of it and push on the book, if I look deep down in at this, and so let's let's give some color to this, so let's make the table red. So if I look at the detail here, my table is not perfectly smooth. We've got you know little nooks and crannies at a very small level. You know, zoom in with a microscope, and then the book also has them as well. And so when you're sliding one against the other, basically you've got it being held up. There's a whole bunch of normal force here that's pushing back on it. If you take two jigsaw puzzle pieces and you put them together, you know, if they're really tightly locked, they don't move particularly well. That would be high friction. And, or, you know, if they're not pushed in as far, then it will move. But how many nooks and crannies there are affects the amount of friction. And so friction does depend upon the surfaces there. Now, the relationship here, we generally don't zoom in on materials, and each material is a little bit different. There is no manufacturing process that produces identical things, at least not bulk manufacturing. I'm suddenly thinking of, is it possible to actually produce two things that are exactly the same? As best as, I, I think that probably the best we can do is electrons. Uh, as best as we know, all electrons are identical. So... Friction here depends upon these two surfaces and how many nooks and crannies there are. And so friction depends upon the surfaces. This is bundled up into something known as the coefficient of friction, represented by the letter mu. There are two types of coefficients of friction. There's mu sub s, which is the coefficient of static friction, or the static coefficient of friction. I go both ways on that one. So coefficient of static friction, and mu sub k, the coefficient of kinetic friction. And the difference is whether it's moving or not. So the idea is that once you get it moving, it can slide. Once you get it moving, it slides more easily across it than when it's just sitting still, but you have to get it going. And so you get two numbers here. Mu sub s is greater than or equal to mu sub k. I have never heard of an exception to that. So this is the nook and cranny model. If we plotted it, because everyone loves a graph, so nook and cranny model. So the friction force and the applied force. So recognize if I want to move something here, so I have a pin sitting right here and I want to move it, I can put a little bit of force on it and it's not going to move. See, it's not sliding at all because friction is keeping it from sliding. I apply a little bit more force. It's still not moving, but essentially I get to a point where it will start to move. Perhaps a better example is if I took this mass right here. I push on it a little bit. I push more and more force. I keep applying the force until it reaches a breaking point, and then it starts to move. Under this model, the applied force is going to build and build and build until I hit a breaking point. This is going to be my maximum static friction. Once I hit that breaking point, suddenly it's much easier to move. And this is my kinetic friction. And so my formulas here are that F static is going to be less than or equal to my coefficient times how tightly these two things are pressed together, which is the normal force. Kinetic friction, once it starts moving, that is a set number, UK times the normal force. Again, normal force is how tightly two things are pushed against each other. It's that force which keeps one object from going through another. And so if so, I push down on the table, the table pushes back on me, I push more force the, the, on the table, and the table pushes back on me with even greater force. So another way of looking at it, in this model right here is that the greater the normal force, the tighter these two things are being pushed together or the more force is keeping one from going through the other, but they are interlocked more the more normal force there is and therefore greater friction. The attraction model, 
is a little bit different. Yeah, you've got the nooks and crannies there, but what's really more important is if I look at the two surfaces, there's actually an attractive force between them. And I lost my color coding, so we'll throw that in there. I've got my table right here. And so there is an attraction. between the two and that what's really this is providing is more surface area for greater attraction instead of being a repulsive force it's an attractive force now if i plotted that under the same model my applied force and my friction force is that it will build and build and build and build and get to a certain point and then it will level off and so this right here is Fs maximum, which is also equal to the kinetic friction. So there's very two clear predictions here between these two models. And then there's a hybrid version of it, which goes with the attraction model, but it still differentiates between the two, and so that graph will look like this. So the question is, if there are these two distinct models, and there was a textbook by Childers and Jones that came out in the 90s, which was an advocate of this model right here, uh, I I'd actually talked to Dr. Jones about that, and he commented that the measurements, you know, if you look under, if you do a search for coefficients of friction, you're going to get a table, and in the table it'll list the two surfaces and then the values, that these values here are found experimentally, and that they're not particularly high precision experiments. And so if you actually brought in error bars, there, there's overlap. There's a lot of overlap between the two values, and you can't really differentiate. And so in this model right here, we have friction is less than or equal to mu times the normal force. And they don't differentiate between static and kinetic. Uh, those that go for still the attraction model, but still say that once it gets going, it's much easier to keep going. Uh, we'll still keep this version right here. But, oh, back to my question of we have two distinct models right here. Why is it that we can't differentiate between those two? And my theory is, my, I'm speculating that physicists usually don't deal with friction. Uh, that's an engineering issue. So physicists, for instance, my dissertation, I was dealing with high energy physics. I'm dealing with particles bouncing, smashing into other particles. And so friction doesn't really make sense. Friction is caused by rubbing. And when you're dealing with particle levels at the quantum level, friction loses meaning. And engineers don't delve into it a whole lot more detail because they have something that works and engineers as a group are generally very practical. So I did try to find someone who did, who's done the high precision experiments and uh, I did find one paper, it was a senior, senior thesis by a college student and I, he did not do enough trials really to differentiate between the two and, but that's all I've seen. I mean, he did a more thorough analysis than I've seen with anyone else, but I, I have not found the paper. So if you happen to run across one, or if you happen to do it when you are in a different point in your life, please let me know. This right here is what your textbooks will be using. This is basically the model that was set up in the late 1700s, and it's still working today, and it's generally, generally assumed that you're going to go with it. This model right here, it takes a while for these things to kick in. Uh, an example, there is uh, an experiment done in the 18, somewhere around 1890, which showed that in outer space there's a vacuum, no substance in outer space, what generally was thought to be ether. I have a textbook from 40 years later that still talks about the ether in, in as if it exists. So it just takes a while for textbooks to catch up. I'm starting to see inroads when I first started teaching physics. The attraction model was not mentioned at all. So, you know, any decade now.